Greetings. My name is Nathan Cooperman. I'm a professor of emergency medicine and pediatrics in the Department of Emergency Medicine at UC Davis School of Medicine. I also serve as the chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine here. Today I'm going to be talking about the development and application of clinical decision rules for limiting inappropriate CT use. I have no financial or other conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide. The outline of today's talk is as follows. First, I'll introduce you to clinical decision rules. Then I will discuss binary recursive partitioning, which is a technique we use to create uh, and validate clinical decision rules. Then I'll talk about a pilot study to limit CT use in children with head trauma that we performed at UC Davis. I'll then talk about research studies to limit both cranial and abdominal CT scans in children with blunt trauma performed in a large multi-center research network. And finally, I'll say a few words about knowledge translation. Next slide. So a few words about clinical decision rules. These uh, rules help clinicians the optimize decision-making process. They help decrease errors of omission, which are errors where you don't do something that you should, and errors of commission, which are errors in which you do something that you shouldn't. Decision rules can help emergency physicians cope with diagnostic, therapeutic, and medical legal uncertainty. And in surveys of emergency department physicians, they strongly support the development of these clinical decision rules, including those for CT use after trauma. Next slide. There are, however, some house rules when an investigator is to create a clinical decision rule, and also when clinicians are to use or adopt clinical decision rules. First of all, is there the need to create such a rule? That is, is this an important question? Is it common? And is there a lot of variation around the practice pertaining to the issue? Do clinicians agree with the need? Because if they don't agree that there's a need, then no one will use the clinical decision rule. Is there reason to believe that the clinician's accuracy is good? Because clinical decision rules are typically constructed from simple clinical variables that one gathers from physical examination and some simple laboratory screening tests. You need a clearly identifiable and important outcome. The outcome should be assessed without knowledge of the predictors, again, to avoid bias in, in uh, collection of the outcome. Similarly, you need clearly defined predictors that are collected prospectively, also blinded to the outcome variable. There has to be standardized data collection and training of evaluators. However, you shouldn't train the evaluators with too much detail because at some point you're going to want this clinical decision rule to be broadly generalizable out in practice and clinicians out there will not have received the same training as your investigators and evaluators. And we measure predictor variables uh, with a kappa correlation coefficient. That is, we want to use variables that there's good inter-observer reliability because if two clinicians can't agree on the presence or absence of a particular predictor, then one can't use that in the construction of a clinical decision rule. Next slide. One ha must have strict definition of your in inclusion and exclusion criteria so clinicians out there know if they can apply the rule to their population. You need a sample size that's sufficiently large and generalizable to make it clinically relevant. And we use multivariable statistical techniques. Recursive partitioning is the typical technique that's used, although you can create clinical decision rules using regression, neural networks, and other techniques. And hopefully the resultant rule will have the following characteristics. First of all, it will be friendly, clinically sensible, and suggest a course of action. It will be highly accurate although the need for accuracy is greatly dependent on the outcome of interest. So if you're trying to predict who will die from a particular intervention, then it has to be very accurate. If you're looking at who, after discharge from the emergency department, might bounce back and be admitted to the hospital, perhaps you don't have to be as accurate. The rule must be prospect prospectively validated in a large independent sample. Uh, ideally, it should change practice and result in more cost-effective care. Now, the statistical technique that we typically use to create these decision rules is binary recursive partitioning. And it's because classification problems are very common in uh, clinical medicine, and they are typically binary. For example, do you get a head CT or not? 
Do you obtain a blood culture or not? And traditional statistical methods are cumbersome for patient classification. They generate prediction equations that are somewhat complicated to use in practice. Recursive partitioning, it doesn't generate an equation. It really successively partitions the data based on the relationship between the predictors and your outcome. It's non-parametric, so no variable distribution assumptions are made, and it displays the outcome as an easily interpreted decision tree. So when we uh, use binary recursive partitioning, the process uh, goes something like this. First of all, it's binary because the software will look at every cutoff of your primary or your root node, uh, and it's examined to determine what is the best dichotomous split of that predictor that will distinguish your outcomes into negative and positive. There are no statistical tests really used. Instead, it performs something called minimization of impurities to get from one node to the next. So that first node is divided into two child nodes, and then those nodes are, exp are uh, ex um, explored in the same way that that root node is. And the process is recursive. That is, the splitting recurs again and again until certain splitting thresholds are met. The strengths of binary recursive partitioning for pa patient classification, again, is that there are no parametric assumptions, so you can capture more general nonlinear relationships between your predictor and your outcome variables. Uh, it includes variable interactions natively in the analysis, and that variables can be used repeatedly in different branches of the tree. You can handle a large number of predictor variables and explores every cut point along a continuous predictor. In addition, recursive partition, next, I'm sorry, that was the next slide, may easily include costs and prior probabilities of outcomes in the creation of the tree and maximizes the sensitivity of identifying cases. For missing data points, it uses surrogate variables for missing data so that patients are not dropped from the analysis. And finally, it yields a decision tree which is simple to apply in practice. So I want to give you an example of a decision rule that we performed at UC Davis a number of years ago using binary recursive partitioning. This was a prospective study over three years in which we studied more than 2,000 children younger than 18 with non-trivial head trauma. Cranial CT scans were obtained at the discretion of the treating physician, and clinical data were recorded on a case report form before CT scans were obtained, if they were obtained, because not all children had CT scans. Two physicians evaluated 5% of the patients to look at the inner observer reliability, as I mentioned earlier, an important uh, component of creation of a clinical decision rule. Discharged patients were followed up by telephone, and admitted patients had their charts reviewed for outcomes. We looked at two, I'm sorry, next slide. We looked at two outcome variables. First was traumatic brain injury visible by CT scan, and you can see the definition there. And the second outcome variable was traumatic brain injury needing acute intervention, which was defined by neurosurgical procedure, hospitalization for two or more nights for the head injury, use of anticonvulsant medication for at least seven days, and persistent neurological deficit. That second outcome was more important to us because that was the clinical re clinically relevant outcome as opposed to the first outcome, which is a CT outcome, uh, which may have some issues with specificity and small findings that are not clinically relevant. Next slide. This is how the decision tree works. Here you notice the outcome is a positive CT, that is traumatic brain injury on CT. And the software finds the first variable that's most important, and that's altered mental status. And if the patient is altered, 15% have a, a positive CT scan. If they're not altered, only 2% do. Uh, I want to mention, by the way, at the start, a total of 1,271 patients were eligible for this analysis because that's the number of patients that had CT scans out of the 2,000. The software then looks at the next important variable, and it's clinical signs of skull fracture. And even for children with a normal mental status, if there's clinical signs of a skull fracture, 13% will have a positive CT. If you're no on both of these variables, the risk is only 2%. The next variable is the presence of a scalp hematoma in a child younger than 2. And if you're no on these three variables, now your risk is down to 
And finally, the last variable identified by the software was their history of vomiting. And if a patient has, is no on all four of these variables, there was a total of 526 patients, and only two had a positive CT scan. So the test accuracy of the rule you can see here in the upper left quadrant, a negative predictive value of 99.6%, sensitivity of 98%, and you can see the confidence intervals there. Next slide. Our second analysis, however, was to predict those that need an acute intervention. This is, again, the clinically important variable, uh, outcome variable, which I mentioned. And here we start with all 2,043 patients because you do not need a CT scan to determine whether the child needed this out, had this outcome. The first variable identified by the software is uh, clinical signs of skull fracture, and if there's evidence of that, there's a 42% risk of acute intervention. If there was no signs of clinical skull fracture, there was 4%. And then I'm going to march down just like in the other tree. The software identified four variables, clinical signs of skull fracture, altered mental status, history of vomiting, or headache. And if the patient had none of these, there were 900 patients and not one had a head injury requiring acute intervention. And you can see in the upper left-hand corner here, the test accuracy was quite good. The confidence intervals are relatively narrow. So when, when one combines these two trees, that is TBI visible on CT and TBI needing acute intervention, you can see that the variables overlap in great part. Three of the variables in the two rules are the same, but headache is present in the, uh, the decision rule for acute intervention, and scalp hematoma in children younger than two years is present in the decision rule to predict positive CT scan. So what we did is we combined these two rules, it has five variables, and you can see that the test accuracy, the native predictive value, and sensitivity for predicting positive CT and predicting acute intervention are both quite good. The study, however, had limitations. Not everyone had a CT scan performed. It was done only at one site here at UC Davis. Uh, it needs external validation. Ideally, you would need a separate rule for pre-verbal patients who are different to evaluate than verbal patients. And ultimately, one needs a large multicenter study to tighten the confidence intervals around the test accuracy and enhance the generalizability. So for that, we turn to the Pediatric Emergency Care Applied Research Network, uh, a federally funded research network supported by HRSA to conduct large observational and interventional trials. And we performed a study that was funded uh, by the Emergency Medical Services for Children program and the Maternal Child Health Bureau of HRSA to really further validate and refine the clinical decision rule that we performed at UC Davis. The goal of this study was to derive a clinical decision rule to accurately identify children at near zero risk of clinically important traumatic brain injury after blood trauma, tra head trauma uh, with high accuracy and wide generalizability. Next slide. The methods were very similar to the UC Davis study. It was prospective. It was conducted over two and a half years in 25 sites in PCARN. Uh, the inclusion criteria you can see are children less than 18. And we had standard exclusion criteria. Uh, importantly, children with very minor mechanisms were excluded, and those with injuries over 24 hours old were excluded as well. Uh, finally, if a child had pre-existing neurological disease that impedes our assessment of the child, we excluded the patient as well. For this study, however, we just had one outcome definition, clinically important traumatic brain injury, which was defined by death from TB from TBI, a neurosurgical proce procedure, intubation for 24 hours or more for the head injury, or a positive CT scan in association with hospitalization for two or more nights for treatment of that head injury. These were the variables considered, and I won't go through all these. There's a lot of them because we enrolled more than 40,000 patients, so we had the power to look at a lot of variables uh, in great detail. And this is how the study went. There were 57,000 eligible patients, of whom 54,000 had a GCS of 14 to 15. We enrolled 78% of them, and we missed around 22% of them. Importantly, these two groups were very similar in their rates of positive CT scan uh, and other clinical parameters. We derived rules in children younger than two and older than two in approximately 34,000 and validated these rules in approximately 9,000 patients.
This uh, is just to show you the inner observer agreement. This is a kappa chart, and you can see here these bars represent the 95% confidence intervals around the kappa between the variables that we considered for inclusion into the decision rule. If the lower end of the 95% confidence interval crosses 0.4, we would not consider it for use in the rule. So for an example, the quality of a scalp hematoma, whether it's boggy or not, the inner rotor reliability was too low, so we could not consider that variable for inclusion into the rule. So the big study was, uh, so we conducted a very large study of 42,000 patients, and uh, we created and validated a NICE rule, and it was published in Lancet a few years ago. And there's a separate rule for children younger than two and children older than two. They're similar uh, in a couple of regards. You can see they both have severe mechanism of injury uh, as one of the predictors, and they both have an abnormal GCS or other signs of altered mental status uh, in, their, um, uh, in the rules. And the rules otherwise differ by a few variables. This slide shows, next slide, I'm sorry, next slide please. This slide shows the rule for children younger than two years, and you can see if you march down this tree, if you have none of the six predictors in the rule, there was 4,529 patients, and only one had a clinically important brain injury. This is the rule for children older than two years. And if you have none of the six variables here, there were 14,663 patients, and only seven had a clinically important brain injury. So if you look at the test accuracy here, on the left side, uh, there, uh, I ha we depict both the derivation and validation samples. You can see in the derivation sample there was 4,529 patients with none of the predictors and only one had a clinically important brain injury. And in the validation set, out of uh, 1,176 patients with none of the six predictors, none had a clinically important brain injury. And you can see the test accuracies below. For children who were older than two, again, very similar. The derivation and validation uh, set has a very high negative predictive value, uh, well over 99.9%, uh, similar to the rule for children younger than two. This is the summary slide of these two rules. This is uh, uh, the figure A depicts children younger than two, and figure B depicts children older than two. And I'll break these down for you in the next slide. So for children younger than two, if there are none of the six factors in the rule, again, altered uh, uh, an abnormal GCS or altered signs of mental status or any of the other four variables, if there was, for children that had none of these predictors, that encompassed about 53.5% of the population, the risk of clinically important brain injury uh, was less than one, than one in 5,000. Our recommendation would be not to CT. That is the clinical decision rule. However, if you have one or more of the predictors, we're not saying that you must get a CT scan. Rather, you can decide whether to get a CT scan or to observe based on the risk numbers that we provide uh, in the clinical decision rule and other factors that you can see listed here. Similarly, for children older than two, if you have none of the six factors, that encompass about 58% of the population with less than one in a 2,000 risk of having a clinically important TBI, we would recommend not to CT. Again, however, if you have one or more of the predictors, you can decide whether or not to CT based on the risk estimates of clinically important brain injury and the other factors listed there. Finally, and briefly, I want to talk about uh, a follow-up study that we did in PCARN on children with blunt abdominal trauma. This was a study that we conducted over three years in which we enrolled more than 12,000 children younger than 18 with blunt abdominal trauma. And we performed a very similar study as we did with the head injury rule, in which we recorded clinical data before the abdominal CT was done, if it was done. Uh, we followed up discharged patients and admitted patients. And our outcome of interest Again, a clinically important outcome was intra-abdominal injury requiring, sorry, requiring therapy. We again performed recursive partitioning analysis, and we ended up uh, having 203 patients with intra-abdominal injury requiring acute intervention, and 761 having any intra-abdominal injury. Similar to the head injury study, 
uh, we derived a rule that encompass these seven variables that you can see listed here. Uh, the variables themselves are not so important, but the principle is important that there was 5,000 patients of the 12,000 who had none of these seven factors. And uh, of those, less than 0.1% had a clinically important intra-abdominal injury, that is, intra-abdominal injury requiring acute intervention, and you can see the test characteristics uh, of the rule um, here on the upper right. And finally, for the last minute or two, uh, I'd like to just say a word about knowledge translation. That is, how do clinicians, that is, how do you get the information from these clinical decision rules to clinicians to use in their practice? And this is a slide I like from uh, Glasgow and Haynes. This pyramid here depicts generation of knowledge, starting with research studies, syntheses, systematic reviews, etc. And then it feeds this pipeline that is pipeline of knowledge translation. And in this pipeline, you need to make the clinician aware, get it accepted, make it applicable. You can see uh, what are these factors that get the information generated by clinical decision rules to the clinician. And you can see there's a lot of leakage of water from this pipeline before it gets to the clinician uh, to make their decision. So how to, do we minimize the uh, trickling of water out of that pipeline. And there have been many studies about what works in knowledge translation. This, uh, uh, these are the recommendations from Kawamoto from 2005. And he stated that clinical decision support is most successful when uh, it's provided automatically uh, in, during the workflow in the emergency department or whatever other setting. The recommendation, I'm sorry, recommendations are given rather than risks. Support is given at the time and location of decision making, and then support is computer based. So in PCARN, we have uh, uh, started a research study s supported by an ARA grant in which we have built in a template into several electronic medical records in which we capture the PCARN head injury predictors and then provide decision support uh, to clinicians and we are measuring in a time series trial uh, whether that decision support decreases the use of, I'm sorry, decreases the inappropriate use of CT scans in children with blunt head trauma. And with that, I'm happy to take uh, any uh, questions you might have. Here are the references uh, for, uh, for your use, and thank you very much.